Welcome to Destination Station, the ISS Science Forum. I'll be your host today, Dan Hewitt. When the International Space Station launched back in 1998, it launched with a vision to one day become a one-of-its-kind orbiting laboratory in microgravity. And it's not enough to just do science on this laboratory. You know, you need direction, you need goals, you need something to strive towards. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Back in 2011, the National Academies of Sciences released a decadal survey detailing a lot of uh, research that it was suggested to take place on board the International Space Station, this to focus NASA's efforts uh, in space and also the efforts of uh, different organizations taking place in the unique uh, environment of the International Space Station. So joining us here today, I have a couple of panelists to help uh, guide this discussion, take some questions and tell us where we are now in the state of station science and where we're going in the future. So for now, I'll just introduce everybody real quick. First, uh, immediately to my right, I have Betsy Cantwell, who is the Director for Mission Development and the Engineering Director at Livermore National Laboratory, and was also the co-chair of that decadal survey, which was titled Recapturing a Future for Space Exploration. Just next to her, we have Julie Robinson, the Chief Program Scientist here at NASA for the International Space Station. Uh, then we have Marshall Porterfield, who is the Director of Space Life and Physical Sciences from NASA headquarters uh, up in Washington, D.C. Then finally, the Chief Operating Officer for CASIS, Dwayne Ratliff. CASIS, again, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space. Before we get into it with our panel here and the people in the room, though, we actually have a special guest joining us uh, live from the International Space Station, Commander of Expedition 40, Steve Swanson. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to talk to somebody actually taking care and doing the science actively on a day-to-day -day basis. I uh, really appreciate you being here with us today. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, and I just like to say to everyone, hello, and also that I'm just proud and honored to be part of the team that performs science up here on the International Space Station. Over 600 scientists contributed to that decadal study and I have the lucky and much easier job of carrying out their work up here. I heard do we have some questions. Uh, I'm ready to go whenever you are. Yep, we have Steve for just a couple of minutes, so we'll go ahead and start off. We have a couple of students here in the audience that will be asking you a question. We'll go ahead and get our first one now. Hello, my name is Sarah Wagner, and I'm from I'm an eighth grader at Duchenne Academy. And my question is, since the ISS is a natural laboratory, has the science duties increased or decreased for American astronauts and yourself? Good question, Gail. I believe it's increased. I don't have the data to back that up, but all I know for sure is that when we're up here, we try to get as much science as we can done each and every day. And it's one of the advantages of being a national lab is we get to help other agencies and government and other companies perform science and do research, and then that in turn helps our economy. All right, next question. Um, I'm obviously not the student um, filling in for her. I'm the teacher. I'm Kathy Duquesne, Sarah's teacher. Um, and our question is, we're growing pea plants, uh, pea shoots, when our CASIS experiment goes up in October. Have you or any of the other astronauts been asked to taste any of the plants grown as part of a science experiment as some of your duties on the station? Thank you. Good question. Uh, as far as I know, the answer to that is no. We have not been asked. Right now, we're doing an exper experiment called Veggie, and the idea of that is just to prove that we can grow edible plants in space. So we're going to harvest those, take them down, back down to Earth, and then study them and uh, analyze them to make sure that they are safe for human consumption. All right, next question. Hello, my name is Jesse Quintanilla. Um, I go to Crystal Ray Jesuit uh, High School. My question is, we saw some really beautiful pictures of you turning on the veggie experiment. Could you tell us more about what the experiment's going to prove? Thank you. You betcha. As I mentioned earlier, the veggie experiment is about pr uh, proving that we can grow edible plants in a microgravity environment. And this is something that is necessary, of course, for if you want to go on uh, even longer duration flights like to Mars or somewhere else that similar to that. Uh, and also, Veggie is a pro prototype of a newer model coming out in a couple of years uh, called the Advanced Plat Plant Habitat. And that's going to even have more functionality, more capability to grow plants. Looking forward to that one, too. 
All right, and Steve, I think we got one more for you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Juan Carlos Galindo, and I go to Crystal Ray Jesuit. Um, the question I wanted to ask is, uh, what kind of fluid samples are returned to Earth for research purposes, and is there a sub sub-zero freezer available, available to store fluid samples? Yes, there is a freezer. We call it Melfi, which is a minus 80 uh, lab freezer. And so as you can imagine, it goes down to minus 80 degrees, which is, uh, keeps all the samples very cold and in a good uh, state. Uh, we put in there, of course, uh, samples from the plants. We also do uh, liquid samples, such as uh, urine, blood, saliva. And all that's to be uh, brought down back onto Earth to be studied by the scientists, and that helps uh, them determine how an organism, either a plant or a human, uh, reacts to this environment. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions that we're going to have for you today, Swanee. Uh, we really appreciate you checking in. I know you're busy. I think you're actually getting ready to go to bed pretty soon, so we'll let you get back to that in Life on Orbit. Uh, again, really appreciate you checking in. It's great to talk to, again, somebody implementing the science uh, in real time on board the International Space Station. My pleasure. Have a good day. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes mm -hmm. our portion of the event. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and jump in with uh, some questions to the panel here. Um, I'll start off uh, again with a couple of questions from me, then we'll go to the audience, give you guys a chance to ask them some questions. We're also taking questions actively from social media, so if you're following along, uh, make sure to use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll get your question in real time. Well, let's jump right in. So, Betsy, I want to start off with you. Again, you were uh, the co-chair of that team that wrote the Decadal Survey, which is influencing a lot of the work we're doing now and in the very near-term future. Uh, can you briefly tell us uh, some of the key aspects to come out of that study uh, that were the key recommendations on behalf of you guys? So I'm, I'm going to take that uh, uh, and, and shrink it down a little bit. It was a 400-page study involving hundreds of scientists looking broadly at what research needed to be done in the physical sciences and the life sciences to underpin the future of space exploration. So I think what I will uh, take the liberty to talk about is a couple of recommendations that we made for the use of the International Space Station. It's obviously a critical science facility to move that science agenda forward. And those two are um, actually both in the life sciences arena. We recommended that um, because animal studies underpin so much of our knowledge and understanding of human health terrestrially, that animal studies be uh, supported more strongly in the space station science program. And for the same reason, uh, and also because microbial studies underpin how much we know about our terrestrial environment, that um, microbial studies be beefed up in the form of, of some long-term ability to study microbes in space on the ISS. So those were really the two key ones then that you wanted to touch on. So Julie, now for you, what are some of the experiments, what are some of the steps that we're now taking right now and in the near term to meet these recommendations? Yeah, so the, one of the first things we did once we once NASA received the decadal surveys, we went through all the recommendations, and there were a large number. We we uh, followed their recommendations in some prioritization approaches, and then we identified new facilities that we needed. One of those was a facility for flying rodents, for flying mice, and eventually rats on the space station. Now we'd done that; we had brought them to the space station before during assembly on shuttle flights, but we needed to rebuild that hardware, make some changes, and especially make it able to allow the animals to be studied for a longer period of time, not just a week or two, as on past space shuttle missions. Uh, you heard Swanee talk about the plant habitats that are in development. Uh, we did a number of, of surveys and discussions with the scientific community to look at the space station as a microbial observatory. What are all the things we should do for that? And then on the physical sciences side, we really started looking at the whole suite of material science work, fluid physics, and combustion, and whether we needed certain kinds of upgrades on those facilities as well. So all of that got put in place, and what we're really seeing starting this year is that the uh, those facilities are going to keep coming online one by one. So Veggie is sort of the first one out of the, out of the gate, but we have new cell culture hardware, we'll have the rodent hardware flying in the fall, and as each of those capabilities comes online, they'll start being used every flight over and over on the space station for the next 10 years. Okay. And then switching gears a little bit, Marshall, over to you. 
Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the life sciences research that we're doing on station and how that's going to fit into some of NASA's bigger goals, such as you know going to Mars and deep space locations. Well, Elizabeth talked about the decadal survey, and within the decadal survey there are recommendations for research that are, is needed to further human exploration, at, to do a Mars mission, mm -hmm. or research is enabled by space. So those are the two, kind of the two categories that we look at in terms of this, the research that we're funding. So if you look at the <clears throat> biomedical challenges that humans face in the microgravity environment, the space station right now is a perfect laboratory to do the long duration types of uh, studies and experiments. So the ability to do rodent research for, long for more extended periods is mm -hmm. really important. Um, we're also building hardware to support um, fruit fly research. And, Fruit flies are an important biomedical model system because out of the 900 documented genes that are known to be associated with human disease, uh, about 700 of those are also documented in fruit flies. So it's a really great model system. You can grow them uh, over multiple lifetimes and um, really get a lot, a lot of valuable data out of it. And uh, the other thing that we're doing in terms of the research that we're doing on stations, we're trying to change the the model for how we do research, too, in order to get the most out of the space station. Mm -hmm. um, the traditional model is to release an NRA based on the decadal, have um, investigators apply to that, and you select a few of those, and it takes literally years to, or in the past it's taken years to fly one of those investigators' experiments. But now that we have, on the life sciences side, genomics and all the other advanced bioanalytical technologies, we can measure so much from those samples what we're going to do is fly the experiment, do all the measurements, and then release the NRA for potentially hundreds of investigators to be able to utilize space station uh, science. So we're really changing the model for how we do research is one of the key things that we're doing. Okay. And then now, Dwayne, on to you. Your role is a little bit different uh, from everybody that we've talked to so far. You know, Betsy representing the group that uh, came up with these recommendations, uh, Julian Marshall, really how we make those recommendations happen with projects. What exactly is Kate yours and Casis' role in making this research happen on board the International Space Station? Right, well, it's really interesting that the decadal survey was created and it had a targeted focus. And how best can NASA utilize microgravity as, a, as an environmental um, platform for their mission-focused elements? With the, the designation of the International Space Station as a national laboratory, in essence, what we've done is we've picked up on the opportunity to see how can that same environmental exposure uh, microgravity, the physics associated with that, be used in supporting research initiatives that are important to, to um, human health and, and other um, opportunities here on the ground. So really our, our difference, if you will, is that we're using the same environment uh, to do the same type of research, um, except the outcomes that we're looking for are targeted more towards how can we benefit mankind. Okay. And then getting back to something you guys touched on a little bit earlier with uh, the decadal talking about exploration. And Betsy, I want to throw this to you first. Um, again, the title of that decadal survey was Recapturing a Future for Space Exploration. Um, the stress that I want to put right now on that exploration word. Uh, could you expand a little bit on the place that life and physical science research on the International Space Station has uh, in future, you know, long duration exploration? and how that research is supporting it? Sure, so, so first let's just basically focus on what the fu some of the key elements of the future of, of humans in space. If we go beyond where we are now, we're talking about longer distances away, regardless of what the end point is, longer periods of time for humans to be in the engineered environment that we create for them, and periods of time potentially for humans on the surfaces of other bodies. Um, and so we focused on what are the critical uh, fundamental studies in the physical sciences and in the life sciences and how could those fundamental studies be transitioned into mission design knowing that and what we were asked essentially because without those studies we probably won't be able to make I think everybody knows there are some pretty big grand challenges in, um, in taking the ne next steps to get a lot further away with humans and we need the science portfolios to begin now in order to get there. Okay, and now drawing things back and a little bit closer <laughs> to home, kind of like Dwayne was saying, where a lot of this research, we like to say we're working off the earth for the earth. That's something we've been throwing around a lot. Uh, so Julie, 
what is some of the science that's having you know a real benefit down to life here on Earth, and how is that fitting into the direction that we're moving in? One of the really exciting things that we see is this synergy between the basic research and the things that are applied for human health here on Earth and things that are applied for astronaut health on an exploration mission. A great example of that is osteoporosis research, where um, you know we, we as NASA need to make sure that astronauts arrive, say, on the surface of Mars with healthy bones, because mm -hmm. wearing a multi-hundred pound spacesuit and tripping on a rock could be life-threatening if you have fragile bones. So that's a huge mission risk we've got to address. And we've been making incredible progress on that using research on the space station. At the same time, uh, Amgen, in one of those earlier mouse flights I talked about, used the space station to study the mechanism of a drug that they had under development. We're able to test that on the space station, help understand that mechanism, and that drug is now on the market, and that's helping people back here on Earth. So um, all of those things kind of combine together. So as we're looking at our whole portfolio of human research, especially with one-year expeditions coming up, uh, the twin study between the Kelly brothers, and then all of the synergy between the new life sciences capabilities, we're really seeing an opportunity for making biomedical advances over the next 10 years. Okay, and then Marshall, one more over to you. And again, touching on something that Julie just said where we're able to use that microgravity environment to do something that wouldn't otherwise be done. Can you explain this a bit about how the space station being in that microgravity allows us to do research that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do here on Earth? Can you give us a few examples? So. I think in the material science areas is really um, there's a lot of potential in terms of uh, advancing uh, that field based on the microgravity environment. If you look at one of the experiments that was just recently conducted looking at uh, complex fluids and colloids mm -hmm. and how they behave in space. If you look at the possibility of forming nanostructures and nanomaterials uh, in the microgravity environment, that's another true possibility that may lead to discoveries uh, for new, ma new materials. And the special thing about the microgravity environment in regards to that is that there's no sedimentation. The influence of gravity is a race of so structures that normally w might be liable on the ground and influenced by shear and flow because of gravity on the ground don't have that limitation. And that that's, I, I also um, advances the uh, fundamental life sciences, looking at protein crystal growth, which Cases is uh, use, looked at using that environment for the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, we look at it more from the materials side, but there's a, a lot of potential there, we believe, and that's why we're focusing on one of our open source science initiatives for the physical sciences side is actually called Materials Lab. Okay. And then, Duane, another one for you. So within the past couple of years especially, there's been a heavy emphasis on commercialization mm -hmm. of space. Um, and you know, there could eventually be a space station built by a commercial enterprise, for instance. You know, it's, it's expanding wildly. Um, what do you see as the most, what do you see as most promising for breakthroughs that might make this kind of reality possible, this, this increased commercialization, especially through research? Right, so, and I think we're kind of hearing this in this conversation today. And, and quite frankly, for us to be successful in demonstrating the value of a commercial entity wanting to, to really kind of exploit and, and invest in um, use of, of microgravity or low earth uh, environment laboratory, we need to actually demonstrate that that value exists. So <clears throat> clearly we do need to look at what's been done in the past and align that with the needs that we know of here on the ground. And what really does bubble up to the surface, if you will, is that within the life sciences, um, there clearly are a lot of uh, health applications that can benefit from using microgravity in, in these research models. In, in my opinion, I think in the life sciences is where we probably will capitalize first. Um, but uh, I agree with Marshall that when we start to look at the physics and physical sciences and mm -hmm. how they're impacted and affected not only by microgravity, but perhaps also by the unique environment that it's in. Um, you know, we have access to the outside of the International Space Station as well, that we'll start to be able to understand that there may be value and, and, and benefits from understanding how materials behave differently or may come together and form differently as a result of being exposed to that environment. I think the key will be, once we gain the knowledge, how do we then translate that not only to application on the ground, but answer some of the more difficult questions which are associated with, do you then create a production capacity mm -hmm. in space or do you bring it home? And, and those are some of the challenges that, that we're at the point where we're asking the questions at the moment. Okay. 
Well, I'd like to change things up a little bit so it's not just me talking. If anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, I mean, certainly uh, invite that now. You just kind of raise your hand and we'll be able to give you a chance. I think we can start right up here. Mark. Thank you. Uh, Mark Rowe. I write for Aviation Week. And uh, I'm wondering if Dr. Robinson could sort of explain, you, you said uh, you want to introduce some rodents by the fall. Um, how many, what kind, uh, where would you like this to go? What can you accommodate reasonably? And what sorts of investigations do you think might come from those that fit the themes that the uh, National Academy of Cicadal has laid out? Sure. Yeah, we are starting on the SpaceX 4 flight will be the first test flight of the upgraded hardware. And it will have uh, 20 mice. In the end, our final capability will be 40 mice per flight. And uh, it will fly a combination of research that uh, Marshall Porterfield's organization has selected by competitive peer review and research that the CASIS organization has selected for its economic value in industrial or pharmaceutical research and development. So um, we'll get started fairly small so that we're sure that we've got good animal husbandry, good characteristics and how we're taking care of the animals. But we'll also be combining experiments together so that we can get as much data as possible from the smallest number of animals. Sounds like the, the animals will travel up on SpaceX and come back on SpaceX as opposed to stay on the station. Uh, so there are two uh, two options. One is to launch um, the animals on the SpaceX and bring them home on the SpaceX. We're not going to be doing that quite yet because there's a fair amount of time, as you know, from splashdown until you can get back to the dock. So um, we also have the the option of of doing a euthanasia and dissecting on orbit. Okay, and then I know we have quite a few members of the research community from local here in Houston. If you guys have any questions for them at this time, I know they'd love to talk to you probably a lot more than they like talking to me. I'm Shishia Huang from Beta College of Medicine. I'm excited to hear that uh, all kind of samples have been collected uh, for genomics and uh, allelomics studies. My question was, what type of uh, infrastructure has been set up for this kind of studies? And also, what have you found out? So we are just at the final stages of um, uh, releasing our strategic plan for what we're doing in this area. So we haven't completely identified who we are going to be um, working with in terms of how we're actually going to process the samples. Um, we have, we have a, general landscape of what the sample processing requirements are going to be like, uh, storage, uh, shelf life, things like that. But we haven't particularly identified if we're going to uh, compete it, how we're going to compete it, and how we're going to award. But we're not going to build those capabilities up within NASA itself. We, we want to partner uh, with outside um, uh, uh, vendors. We are, in terms of the data storage, we're talking right now with DOE and their K-Base capability that they just invested in. I think it's a $60 million investment in their uh, omics data st storage capabilities and also NIH. So on the informatics side and the data side, we're, we're just looking at who we're going to partner with. And of course, too, we're working with, with CASIS and they brought other commercial um, entities, the Broad Institute, to the table. And we have participation in terms of how we're organizing this um, from uh, industry side for CASIS and from uh, the traditional academic community so that we make sure that what comes out of this gene lab project is a product that is going to fuel human exploration but also provide as much opportunity for translational and uh, uh, commercial participation also. Okay, I think we might have had a couple more. Um, yeah, I'm Jessica Scott from Baylor College of Medicine, um, and I'm interested in microgravity cell culture experiments. Um, so I'm wondering, how does the hardware differ on doing cell culture in space, and what are some of the challenges that you faced in that area? Well, I think the, the hardware differs to the degree that um, it, it's, it's a different process, if you will, in order to conduct your experiment. Um, the transportation and other logistics associated with getting to that laboratory um, obviously are quite different. So you see um, differences in some of the hardware that is necessary to support the experiment to success, such as incubation and power and things like that. <clears throat> the general premise behind how you would conduct cell culture there is very similar. Um, we're working with several commercial companies that are helping us develop 
sort of the, the cutting edge or, or latest gold standards, if you will, within cell culturing. And that's a partnership with CASIS and NASA um, to develop that. But um, at the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that the science objective that, that the researcher has um, can be performed in space exactly as they would on the bench uh, top on the ground. You guys pick, someone's there. I'm uh, Carlos Montesinos with Astromed Research Institute. Uh, we're a consortium of academia and private industry. Um, and I'd like, if you wouldn't mind spending a minute or so talking about the differences between getting flight approval for protocols uh, between the cases and CPHS and other traditional NASA, you know, within NASA mechanisms. Right. Well, that's a great question, and I think this is one of the, the one of the most intriguing opportunities that we have as CASIS um, to support the national laboratory. And, and again, that designation um, in and of itself is what has opened up the opportunity for many researchers to even consider using the International Space Station as their research laboratory. So at CASIS, we have developed grant calls that are very similar to what you'd see coming out of NASA or NIH, where there's a, a fairly rigid structure around what it is that we're looking to support from a research perspective. Um, we typically, almost every quarter, issue some call within the life sciences or physical or material sciences and, and remote sensing and enabling technologies. But at the same time, you know, we have a significant challenge with respect to uh, time and availability of the National Laboratory to conduct all the necessary research that we think may have value and success. So one of the things I think we do a little differently than what you see coming out of NASA or other large federal agencies is that we entertain the concept of ideas coming to us. So if you will, from an unsolicited manner, we um, actually entertain a, a, a science or technology proposal and we'll actually work with an investigator to help them understand some of the necessary constraints, if you will, um, that are still in place in order to successfully conduct research on ISS, but make that a much less tedious process and one that doesn't necessarily constrain the objective at the end of the day. So with CASIS, we, we kind of um, consider ourselves as a customer service um, uh, opportunity here where we can entertain grants, we can entertain uh, other um, uh, research objectives and ideas, but then hopefully foster that through the process. Our customer base is a little different. We are actually trying to focus on commercial utilization. So if you, if you uh, think about it, we're actually trying to find customers who have quite frankly never thought about using ISS as part of their research portfolio. So there's a lot of early education that, that, um, and, and sort of help along the way that's necessary in order for them to be successful. Um, Angela Carter from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I know you guys are, the fact that you have rodents on there going on there is really great. So um, with rodent models you can do multiple experiments and I was thinking not just the anatomical looking at, you know, expression of stress signals and hormones and such and, and osteoporosis, but what about the neurocognitive um, aspects like doing behavioral and learning and memory assays, especially for stuff, um, for studies that um, could actually further the mission to Mars. I was wondering what you guys thought about that. That's definitely an, an important area and an area that NASA is focused on the risks even to astronauts in doing neurocognitive studies. That's one of the reasons that we plan to eventually um, take advantage of the future capability of flying uh, rats instead of mice. Uh, normally, you know, you want to fly the smallest organism that you can to get the sample size, but um, in a lot of different neurocognitive studies, rats are a better model. And so, uh, so we're expecting that that kind of research will either be selected by space life and physical sciences at NASA in the future, or also be of interest to uh, commercial R&D. Okay, my name is Blessan Selvanesan. I'm from Baylor College of Medicine. My question is, when you do experiments on microgravity, do you also, especially the rodent experiment, do you also have controls for cages where you can simulate 1G? Uh, so, it, that's it. Controls are a complicated question. Uh, we do uh, simultaneous ground controls or slightly delayed ground controls so that we have the environmental uh, situation matched and we also do those in the exact same kind of cage. But when you, if you start spinning something to produce artificial gravity, you really start making, if you don't do it right, you create an amusement park ride, which really isn't a control for anything. So uh, right now our Japanese colleagues are working with us on a joint study of whether we might be able to add a central Centrifuge capability for some ground controls or for some for some spun controls on ISS. Uh, the struggle is to have that arm length 
big enough that it's a real control. And, and there's some debate as to whether or not there's such a thing as a real control when you're spinning. Because as you know, um, the way that you feel when you're on an amusement park ride is not 1G. It's different because you, those forces aren't evenly distributed across you the way they are here on Earth. One more question. Does this cage also have capacity for reproduction? So can you mate the animals? Can they deliver pups there? So this is an, an important area that the Decadal Survey talked about and, and recognized that that was fairly far down the road. You know, we, right now, this we know, and we've done, I think, over history, there have been over 35 cases of studies where mice have flown into space, but they've never been more than about two weeks with a couple of small exceptions. And so we need to be sure that we've got the animal husbandry right, that we know how to sustain mice for 30 days or 60 days or even 90 days before you can start entering into looking at those those reproductive capabilities. That it, but that is something that the National Academies and the, and the scientific community has asked for, and it's something that I think uh, Marshall and may want to talk more about his strategic plan, but it's definitely something in those out years towards the end of ISS in the, in the strategic yeah, plan as the well. Development of biology is one of the key areas that was um, dealt with in, by the decadal survey, but we don't have to limit ourselves to rodent research in order to accomplish that. Uh, fruit fly, I mentioned before, is an, um, an incredible uh, research system that's really important to biomedical research, and we are going to include centrifuge controls. Uh, for fruit flies, and also nematodes are great um, uh, developmental biology systems, and even plants. We share a lot of genetic similarities with plants. We can learn a lot of, with plants, and the European uh, modular cultivation system that we partner with uh, ESA in having USPIs uh, do experiments on, it actually has centrifuge for, for plants also, too. So there are other systems that, that provide that type of control, but it really is important to get 1G or partial G controls in the microgravity environment that greatly expands the value of the science that we get from it. There is a really simple developmental biology experiment going on on ISS right now, which is using Saccharomyces yeast, that's brewer's yeast, as a, as a model organism. And in the past, some studies have been done that show that when the yeast divide, they bud, one, one yeast cell turns into two, and, that, and on Earth, they always bud in the same axis. So there's a little scar where they separate, and that's always in the same place. But when they've been grown in space, they have scars all over the place in every different orientation. And so that's one of these kind of preliminary results that really really makes us as biologists scratch our heads and say, wow, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean for the way that the chromosomes are lining up at mitosis? What does that mean for the development and the division of cells? Brian, you work at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, as the demand for in vivo models for research, whether it be the fruit fly or rodent models, increase, uh, it's apparent that there's also going to be an increased demand for crew time to process these samples. Uh, and the limitation now seems to be sort of 40 mice in the hands that can then dissect those, store tissues, and conduct the experiments. So what are the plans long term for use of robotic dissection and robotic data collection uh, on the International Space Station? We actually have a phase A study right now looking at telerobotic capabilities um, that, that we have commissioned. It's We've recognized for a long time that the issue of uh, limitations in crew time, there's lots, there are many limitations in terms of US, uh, ISS utilization. And so it is a finite uh, resource. So we are looking at novel ways like that to offload some of the crew time um, requirements. The other way that we're trying to uh, uh, increase ISS utilization is through the open source science initiatives I talked about earlier, gene lab and materials lab. Instead of flying an experiment, for a single PI who has a limited number of hypotheses and a small number of things that they're actually going to measure, use the, the, the next generation biotechnology and bioanalytics that we have available now and measure everything and fly an experiment for a community, populate an informatics database that's open to the scientific community to go into, and we will fund researchers to do the ground-based derived experiments to understand the phenomena that they observe within those, the, those um, omics arrays, basically. We want to do um, uh, integrated omics approaches in gene labs. So that's the other way that we're trying to work around those types of limitations. 
the other thing we'll do is when we will eventually with SpaceX have a live return capability worked out and that will help uh, for, for systems that change slowly, that will help us need less crew time. And then we're also using international collaboration with our Japanese, our Russian colleagues, and others to, to, um, to help make that better. And then, of course, when we go to commercial crew uh, around 2017, that will add another full crew member uh, hands-on to conduct research. And that's going to be very important for our scientific community. I think that's a really good point because talking about the, the use of rodents as a as an organism model for research, um, if that proves to be quite valuable, um, and and that you know added crew time or human intervention is a necessity in order to be successful, this is really informing us, if you will, on how we create the the next generation um, platform for research and development. And and these are some pioneering efforts that we're doing right now. But I think um, if we understand the need for more human intervention and larger sample sizes of rodents. We're actually doing a great job of trying to determine what the, the next ISS capabilities will be, will be set up to, to do. If I can offer a follow-up, um, one of the other things that we appreciate using rodent models is while they're an accelerated model for human disease, uh, the time that's suggested for experimentation on the space station is still quite narrow in 60 days. So what's the plans moving forward to extend those to month-long or if not year-long experiments so that we can gather uh, sort of prudent information about disease progression that then may have applicability to human pathology. Well, I think I can speak on behalf of, of Cases and our customers who are actually interested in, in doing some of these applied uh, research studies. Um, clearly, duration is something that they're, they're very interested in. And as Julie pointed out earlier, with these earlier ex experiments, we're trying to demonstrate, number one, the, the technical capability and feasibility that this can be um, a viable uh, model on ISS. But I, I would say that it's in our plans to actually increase the duration as quickly as we can. The system that we've developed is flexible. So um, essentially, you can fly extra cages, and you can just move the animals from one cage to another and bag it to return it and then clean it up and relaunch it. So it's a, it's a kind of a recyclable system for the hardware. And so that means there's no inherent limit in how long a study could go. It will eventually just be determined by the scientific needs. Uh, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com and Space.com. Um, with, with regards to crew time and also with um, bringing on new hardware, has there been talk as well about the crew itself in terms of matching skill sets, um, if in terms of crew selection, about or what limitations exist um, having crew that may not be familiar with the specific disciplines of science that you're pursuing? So what we do, and, and this has already been in place for a while now, is we have core life scientist training for every crew member, just like we have core robotics training, and just like we have core EVA training. So you know, no, no astronaut comes in knowing how to do spacewalks. And an astronaut doesn't have to come in knowing how to do life sciences research. We can teach them. So uh, we're working our way through the entire pre-flight astronaut core, making sure they have um, all of those key skills to be able to carry out this research. They get in the lab. They learn how things work. And then we're also, of course, we also have experiment-specific training for all of the crews before they fly. So they know the experiments that they'll be doing and, and know all the specific skills they might need. Jason Sakamoto from uh, Houston Methodist. Now, if we go after a proposal, let's say, uh, via CASIS or NASA, how much uh, crew time or astronaut time can we anticipate to interact with our experiments, uh, or must they all be self-contained? So I, I'll answer this first, and, and I can't stress enough that one of the things that we're trying to do is not constrain the scientific objective. So whatever the research interest is or the investigation interest is, we really want to understand what do you believe is necessary to be successful. Um, we don't want to put a limit on, on any of the, the resources um, at, at that moment. But I will say that once we understand the science objective and we enter in, into some, some of these educational conversations, we do work very closely with NASA to understand, OK, are there limits that we may face? How do we work around these so that we can still ensure success of the science objective, but maybe create a different um, pathway, if you will, from A to B to get there? So it's, it's something that um, I, I can't stress enough that we don't want to constrain the science. We want to actually understand it as fully and as capably as we can at the front and then work very closely with our subject matter experts on how to, how to have that success at it's the end. Similar to how we run our NASA research announcements, we don't really ask that a, a PI define the crew time and um, 
and those types of research integration uh, issues. So we try to encourage the best science possible, and the peer review is um, done um, by experts in the field, and the scoring of the grant itself would then be followed up by a technical fe feasibility study. So you have to look at it. Does the hardware exist to fly the experiment? Yes, no, and are there are there potential crew time limitations that would have to be uh, negotiated and looked at? So, but to give you a range, um, experiments that we fly today, say of the 200 that are on orbit right now, they probably range in time from 15 minutes to 130, 140 hours. Now, 140 hour experiments usually are either with human subjects or with rodents and then we we combine investigators together whenever we can we find those synergies so usually if something takes 140 hours it's actually meeting the needs of multiple investigators and uh, there are some experiments that have been recycled reflown 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 over time they can accumulate a fair amount of time if the science is really good I'm actually really impressed I've been working with life sciences payloads for over 15 years and it really is impressive how automation, telemedicine, if you will, to some degree, um, a lot of different workarounds have been created um, that actually help with the, the bottlenecks that we actually have, um, one, one of those being crew time. But uh, it, it's really kind of neat to see a payload come together when um, the investigator, the customer, if you will, clearly understands the science, but may not have thought about the process that might be a little different for doing it in this laboratory. I'm very interested in the omics array you just mentioned. So can you explain a little more about that? What type of array are you, and are you thinking about doing? How you can do that? So if you look at the genome and the ability to sequence a genome, we now have transcriptomics. So you, or you can look at which of those messages in the genome are being translated into, me into messages. And then from messages into proteins, and proteins into all, all the biomolecules, so proteome, metabolome. Usually those are done separate, and NIH um, um, stores a, the data from the, the work that they support for those in separate databases. So none of those channels talk to each other. You really can't see the multi-dimensional landscape of how gene, the flow of biological information comes from genes into biological activity. And that's what we want to capture. We want to measure all of those different omics channels together so that it's relevant within the context of a particular measurement or experiment. That way a researcher can see how biological activity relates to turn it, whether a protein is phosphorylated or not, or a gene, a particular a gene or two is, are turned on or off. So it's really the ability to integrate those different omics layers in, in a multi-dimensional landscape is our challenge. So we're actually, that's why we're working with DOE and NIH and, and also talking to NIST about how we partner at the multi-agency level because it is a challenging uh, um, uh, goal, but also too, just in developing the informatics, you think of the next generation informatics tools it's gonna to take to be able to do that. I believe that there's um, commercial, um, uh, there should be, there's gonna be IP development and commercial activity related with that. And that's why we're working closely with our cases uh, partners in order to um, bring this forward. And so it, so that challenge uh, of creating that also impacts our ability to do personalized medicine in the future too. So there is the, the direct biomedical. So it's not something that necessarily would wouldn't uh, couldn't be done on the ground. It isn't need, We don't need space to do this. But our ability, our need to utilize the ISS is accelerating the innovation in the, in this in this new area of integrated omics. But once that data is all together, it's so powerful, right? Because, because any gene that anybody on Earth is studying, you go to the database and see what space normal is, and you may learn that that gene is doing something that it, uh, in space that it doesn't do on Earth, and that opens up a discovery mode that isn't available any other way. That's why it's so exciting. What about IPS cells? I mean, have you guys thought about that? I mean, rodent models are great, but if you want to be more translational, IPS cells would be the perfect, you know, and they're immortalized after you collect the tissue. So have you guys thought about? Yeah, in fact, uh, cases uh, just closed an RFP looking at, at those opportunities. I think we awarded six or eight um, studies that will begin to address um, use of IPS cells, stem cells, and, and other, um, you know, below the, the whole organism models for uh, station research. 
So what are the plans to develop um, the capabilities to drive omic platforms on station? Um, in other words, not relying on the return of the sample, but the ability to actually assay those samples in real time and use that information to uh, make countermeasures or actionable items on station. So is that a long-term goal and, and where do you see that going? We have not moved in that direction because we have a lifetime of issue with regard to the ISS. So hard, really um, complicated hardware development projects like, that, like what you're saying would require, may be pushed out towards the, the end of the lifetime of the ISS, so we'd only get it online for a very short period of time. That's also going to create a, potentially a bottleneck in terms of crew time for processing the samples and doing the, the analytics on orbit. Plus, you know, how quickly these technologies change. They just are, are, are changing so quickly that by the time you got a piece of hardware flight certified and got, had the protocol and all the kits to, in, a, in order to be able to use it, it would be two generations out of date compared to what we could do on the ground. So we're not going to chase the technology in space. We're going we're gonna to rely on uh, uh, sample stowage and, and preparation and rely on the, those kinds of capabilities on orbit and then just bring the samples back. What will the availability of the crew themselves to be used as subjects in neurocognitive experiments be, both on, ISI, on ISS and on Earth as a within subject control? So um, the way that our human research program is set up, that's NASA's research program, has, we have a set of risks um, that are identified that are the risks for future exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And the entire program, all of the research opportunities are announced for peer review to address those risks and the, the studies are selected according to that risk model. However, there is the opportunity for additional researchers who see something not related to exploration to go to cases and propose to use the crew as subjects and then we put those things together on a non-interference basis so that both kinds of research can be done. And in fact, we've just exercised that opportunity uh, recently, um, not necessarily neurocognitive but looking at um, intracranial pressure. Um, an excellent sort of uh, uh, subject um, pool, if you will, because of the, the microgravity in, in the population that, that the astronaut crew represents, um, but directly focused on understanding this for some Earth uh, impacted value. So um, we've, we do that on a regular basis. Any more here in the room? We could take a couple of social media questions real th quick, I think. We have a couple of social media questions. So um, on the topic of animals, we have uh, someone asking about what would be some of the obstacles in uh, sending animals to the space station and doing long-term research, and how can we do more of that? Um, so really the biggest obstacle is the practical one of um, launches, scrub turnarounds, uh, getting animals of the right age to orbit on the right vehicle. And then um, we think we know pretty well how to operate the hardware once they're there. Um, but it's just, you know, just like with launching human crews, uh, you know, they get, on, they get on the spacecraft, then there's something wrong, they get back off the spacecraft. So that's, that's a little tricky for our investigators to get used to. Um, but, uh, but at least for these rodent models, it's something that is pretty well understood from previous spaceflight experience. And what we're really doing is pushing the time threshold rather than doing something too new. We have another one here asking about uh, 3D printing. Wants to know um, what do we hope to get out of 3D printing experiments on the space station? Okay. So um, I'll take that one since I'm sitting on the National Academies Committee that's looking at 3D printing in space. And I can't talk about that report because it's not out yet. But if you think about the materials studies that these gentlemen were talking about and um, and look at additive manufacturing or 3D printing. The state of the art in the science side of that is the creation of whole new types of materials by being able to actually print things that have never existed in nature before. So if you think about what the possibilities are for doing that for uh, either in space or for space, um, it's really as exciting as the field of 3D printing itself. However, as early stage as the field of 3D printing itself is. Um, lots of opportunity, and I think the fact that they'll be launching, I believe there'll be two 3D printers, uh, an Italian and an American 
uh, 3D printer in the next year or so on the station uh, demonstrating what we can and can't do and giving us uh, printed objects that we can study um, is huge. It'll begin to narrow that space of possibility to something that really is useful. You guys must have thought about this. Well, it's, it's, so the concept of additive manufacturing, I mean, if, if there's a common theme that you hear um, in this conversation today, it's all about logistics, right? Um, so the ability to actually create um, your consumables or the resources that you need for research or everyday living, for that matter, uh, on ISS is, is really sort of a compelling idea. So we look at not necessarily the science aspect of it, but the, the applicability of 3D printing for us in order to be sort of a logistics um, problem solver. The exploration technology piece of it is also important. Mm -hmm. So right now, today on the space station, we have almost all the spare parts we think we could ever urgently need. And uh, if you're looking at a Mars mission scenario, you can't take all of that mass with you. So the idea that you could take precursor materials and then only make the parts that you need, it really improves that mass equation and it improves safety. And I, I have to add that I believe there's a NASA funded study at the moment looking at how to recycle um, objects that are already on the station to be reused in, in 3D printing. It's simpler than it will probably end up being, but is a really interesting approach to uh, saving mass and, and volume. Thank you for that. We, we do have another one here. Um, this one is actually on the uh, new veggie experiment that went up on SpaceX Dragon. And uh, they're just wanting to know if veggie is successful, how does this change um, space travel? And uh, what other obstacles do we face with that? So NASA in the past has done a lot of research on plant growth in space based on the idea that for long duration missions you would need to be able to cre create some of the materials you need to support yourself along the way. Uh, nutritionally, storage of vitamins is, um, um, is uh, problematic because of the radiation in the spaceflight environment. So the idea would be that um, the, what the veggie experiment will demonstrate, hopefully, is that the, we can grow the vegetable crops, but that they don't harbor any pathogens from the spaceflight environment. So this is getting back to the idea of ISS as a microbial observatory. It's a really unique environment. It's closed. The only um, um, uh, bacteria that, that come into the environment are the ones that come on us or potentially on the other materials we bring up. So we want to demonstrate that we can grow salad vegetables in space on a, at least a small scale, show that they're not um, harboring any pathogenic bacteria, so in the future, at least this is a supplement to, for nutrition, provide a source of fresh vitamins and fresh nutrients. Um, and it's also been shown in the past that it provides psychological comfort. So you can't forget the fact that you're, you're going to put people in a can for a, a year and um, think pieces of the earth that we can look at and touch and feel uh, have provide a lot of psychological comfort for the um, for astronauts and cosmonauts okay well we're getting a little short on time so there was one more question I wanted to ask each of you just to pose it real quick and so as we you know we're moving forward we have this guidance we have all this research we're now looking for that's not only going to help us here on Earth, but help us get to Mars and you know, let humans go further out into space than ever before. What do you think, in your own words, will really be the, the lasting legacy of the International Space Station with all, with all of this going on? What a great question to expound on. But, mm -hmm. but um, I think about that from, say, 100 years in the future when I'm standing on the surface of Mars looking back at the planet. What is the story that, that we will carry forward with us? And clearly to me, if we do it right, part of the story will be that we solved some of the intractable challenges associated with things like long duration exposure to radiation, long duration exposure to microgravity. We'll, we'll have used the station to solve those challenges. I will know that 100 years from now. I'll actually remember it like we remember stories about, I think, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Those are apocryphal stories, but I think that's what we'll remember about the state. Julie? You know, it, there are a couple of things I could talk about in life and physical sciences, but I'm going to pass on those because there's a few disciplines we really haven't talked about yet. So we've got the alpha magnetic spectrometer that could yeah. be making the first observations of strangelets, you know, these, sub, these uh, particles that 
you can make in a in an atom smasher, but you never see in nature. And Very so, strange. if there's any instrument that will ever be able to see these, it's the alpha magnetic spectrometer, and that's collecting data constantly. Also, this year we have our first of an ongoing suite of earth science instruments going up that will be making all kinds of new observations about the earth. So the first instrument to ever make measurements of the actual depth of clouds is called CATS. It's demonstrating a brand new technology. It'll be going up onto the space station later this year. Rapid SCAT, which fills a gap in hurricane modeling data because other wind measurement devices aren't operating around the world right now. And uh, OPALS, which was just unpacked on space on the last SpaceX flight uh, will be testing laser calm. So there are all of these other things going on outside the space station that actually don't have anything to do with microgravity and it's amazing to realize what this laboratory does, how many different disciplines it addresses. There's never been anything like it and I think we'll look back and, and realize it, having that all in one place. It's like a university all together with all the disciplines and I don't know that we'll see that again. I think one of the most important um, objectives that I have from my perspective um, in my role working with NASA is to ensure that we get as much high quality science accomplished on the space station while we have it that is responsive to the decadal. Um, the open source science crowds, crowdsourcing initiatives are a way to um, um, amplify um, and multiply the research throughput, but it also creates a competition and brings in innovation. And we're really, truly going to have to uh, drive innovation if we're going to uh, develop the next generation biomedical support systems and the next generation um, uh, uh, technologies that come out of the physical sciences program that are going to advance human exploration. Now, we don't have our Gene Lab initiative fully um, uh, online yet, but the, if you look at the studies that were selected by uh, the Human Research Program and by the NASA Space Biomedical Research Institute in support of the twin studies, loosely th that's been integrated, those PIs, those 11 projects are integrated in a way that is operating based in, in a way that's analogous with the Gene Lab model. So I think that potentially the, gene, the twin study having genetically similar individuals and all the, the data that we're going to be able to collect using advanced omics technologies, that database on its own may be one of the most important biomedical um, projects ever accomplished on the ISS. And it will yield data and the data that will be rich and useful for years, potentially decades to come. Right, yeah, I, I really see it, as magnificent of, a, of an endeavor and a technological advancement that the ISS is. And, and the wonderful returns that we're already getting thus far, and we, we have at least 10 more years um, to continue to discover. In, in my opinion, um, the ISS will represent the beginning of a pioneering effort in low Earth orbit. And it, it will be the first of its kind, and hopefully set the stake in the ground, if you will, for what we will continue to enjoy years out into the future, as Betsy stated. Okay, and I'm hearing we have one question on the phone bridge real quick, so I think it's from University. Are you there? Hello, it's Elizabeth Howell here. Thank you very much. Uh, this probably is for Julie. I was seeing on Real NASA that you have horseshoes that are going to be uh, being used very soon on the station. Can you talk about any other sort of newer uh, human uh, science experiments that are happening up there? Oh, force shoes. At first on the bridge, it sounded like you said horseshoes, and I couldn't think of that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know, early on the space station, we had some force measurement data that was collected, clear back in the single-digit expeditions. And, and from that, we found that we were not loading crews anywhere close to 1G when they were on the treadmills. Um, and that led us to have to design new harnesses, design new backpack systems, design new bungee systems, and we really went through a full stage of exercise equipment development because the first exercise equipment we flew on the space station didn't work. It was not protecting bone the way it needed to do. So now on the space station, we have that next generation of hardware, but the force measurement that we had hoped to get that was built into the hardware didn't wind up working. And so by taking these force shoes onto ISS, we'll be able to actually measure the forces and see what loading we're getting. Um, that's really hard to predict uh, when you've got somebody doing something as complicated as running on a treadmill or doing squat thrusts on our um, resistive exercise device. So by putting all of those things together, 
Um, we are really making progress on the bone loss problem. We, we're now finding the right combination of diet and exercise to say protect bone mass density. That was published uh, in late 2011 in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. Now we've got to focus on the structure of the bone and be sure that the bone that astronauts are retaining or, or rebuilding is still as strong as, as bone would be on Earth. And so you can see how then all of those, that data, the force data and so forth, both helps us know what kind of exercise equipment to take to Mars, because it's got to be compact, but also then how to take the things that we're learning about rebuilding astronaut bones, bring that back down here to Earth and, and help uh, people who are struggling with bone loss themselves here. Okay, well, I think that's going to do it for us today. This was, again, the first Destination Station ISS forum. I'd like to, again, thank our panelists here for joining us, give us, us some great insight into the science of today, and the science going to be coming online tomorrow. Again, for all of our guests here in Studio B, really appreciate your time and questions. Uh, as always, you can always find out more about station and station science by going to nasa.gov station and following us online on our multiple uh, social media outlets. Again, thank you again for everybody here in the room. That'll do it for us today. I'm Dan Hewitt. Thanks for joining us.